तव मूर्ति विनोदकारी पल पन विसरे नहीं जो विसारी जुगल चरण सोल चिन्ह जेह नजर समीप रहो अमारी एह नजर समीप रहो अमारी एह बोलो घनश्याम महाराज नी जय हरि कृष्ण महाराज नी जय स्वामी नारायण भगवान नी जय सुप्रीम ओम आईडी हर बलवेद घनश्याम महाराज the path maker to our liberation, our utmost dear Puja Guruji, Puja Santo and all of you devotees, Jai Swami Narayan. Just like last time, we had uh, first began with the question answer session and then the presentation. Today also consists of a curious devotee of Bhagwan Swami Narayan who asked four questions um, via email loyadamenji at the rate gmail.com and from there we want to take our discussion or lecture this way with a uh, question and answer session from this devotee's questions you can see that he's a spiritual aspirant or we can call in spiritual context a mumukshu and these questions that he has asked are very very some advanced some mild but from his perspective this mumukshu definitely wants to get on the path of god and worship bhagwan and from that i was very intrigued by his questions so without further ado we're going to go with his first question and then move on to the others so his first question is how can one develop blind faith it's a very very short question yet it has much weight to it blind faith something that is very very important in the path of liberation first and foremost faith faith is something that does not mix with science we can say it's kind of like oil and water they just don't mix in the same way where there is science there isn't faith and where there is faith there isn't science faith in the matter that someone telling us that you see that wall there behind the wall there is a 150 carat diamond now this wall you've been seeing for many many years and all of a sudden a person comes and tells you that this wall behind it has 150 carat diamond but would you believe it would you have faith especially faith so blind faith it's very very hard to develop but this Haribhagat's question of how can one develop faith from there all the answers that for the questions are all based off of Bhagwan Swami Narayan's Vachnamrut, which is the most most authentic scripture that is out there and that will ever exist. Because Bhagwan Swami Narayan's supremacy reigns forever and due to that he spoke and his Sadguru Santos wrote and jotted down and composed the Vachnamrut. And Many, many santos say that in the Vachnamrut, everyone's solutions are there. There is not a single person that on this planet that has come here before, is presently here, and in the future that will come. If they have a problem, there is not a single problem that the Vachnamrut cannot solve. So today's answers will be based strictly off of the Vachnamrut Bhagwan Swami Narayan's own Vani or words. But alongside that, I also did a little researching just to help break down in modern context. And some examples that I will use will be off of off of a context which is around us in our in our, in our environment. 
so that one can put things into perspective. <clears throat> so the question is, how can one develop blind faith? Now, if you have complete confidence in something or someone, you have faith. That's something that is a norm. Um, confidence, putting complete trust, we can say, into a particular person, a particular, you can say, even theory, uh, a particular kind of uh, a method. That kind of faith, or that kind of confidence is called faith. Faith is synonymous with the word trust. It goes along with it. Thus, if someone is faithful, then they are someone you can have faith in. Thus, blind faith is having complete confidence in someone or something without any reason to do so. That's the bottom line. You don't need a reason to have blind faith. It's just there. That's why it's called blind. Now, with a reason or without a reason, the main question is to become blind. Now, developing this, how can it be developed? Meaning, it's kind of like asking, how can you make a pie without its ingredients? It's possible? Is it not possible? It's kind of like that. But blind faith is when you look at everything positively and, and say that whatever God, God's will is for the best. Now, Bhagwan Swami Narayan, in his Vachnamrut Gurdra, first chapter 33, states this very base question and this word blind faith in this Vachnamrut. Let's see what Bhagwan Swami Narayan has to say. I'm going to read the context so that if I read from the middle, you won't understand, so I'm just reading the context paragraph. Thereupon, Muktanan Swami asked, the scriptures have described innumerable spiritual endeavors to please God. But amongst them all, which one is so powerful that it alone earns as much pleasure of God as it is earned by performing all spiritual, spiritual endeavors combined? So kind of like an all-in-one master key. If I do this, then everything else will be composed in it. Please reveal it to us. Muktan and Swami asked. Sri Maharaj began by saying, Please listen as I tell you the one spiritual endeavor by which God can be pleased. He then continued, Accepting the firm refuge of God is the single greatest endeavor amongst all spiritual endeavors for pleasing God. That refuge, though, must be extremely firm and without flaws. Now, Bhagwan says refuge is the main method or key. Now, he's going to state three of them. This refuge can be of three types. One type, one way of having the refuge of God is with blind faith. If a person has intense blind faith, then even if someone such as a Brahma were to attempt to deflect him from his refuge, he would not be deflected. The second type of firm refuge of God that is cultivated out of love, and the third type is out of understanding. Bhagwan Swaminarayan also bases his faith, his refuge in three categories, one being blind faith, second being love, and third being understanding. Any of these three would work in connecting with God. But here it says for blind faith, if a person has intense blind faith, then even if someone like Brahma, the creator of the universe, were to attempt to deflect him from his refuge, he would not be deflected. This kind of faith should be should be developed. Now, the question is how? How can one develop? Now, I want to give you some modern examples to kind of fit things into perspective because there is no particular formula for how. It's kind of just like there. It's kind of like diving into the pool. You don't think about it. Oh, what's going to happen? You just dive in. In the same way, I want to give you three examples so it fix, fits into perspective. Number one, suppose you live in New York City and you live <clears throat> in Staten Island and you want to go 
to the Freedom Tower, which is located in Manhattan. You take a taxi and you call a taxi Uber. You call them and you sit inside of Uber and with firm blind faith, you don't know the taxi driver. You don't know if he's going to take you into an alley, do something else. You don't know if he is under the influence. You don't know his mental status, his stability. Yet, we sit in the back of his taxi and we just tell him, I want to go to Manhattan, the Freedom Towers. And that's it. And from there, you text on your phone, you call a couple people, you do your work, you read a book, you do so many things without even one single thought that this person might pull the car into another area, maybe rob me, I might get kidnapped. There is no kind of doubt, such kind of blind faith. If you think about it, if you ever sat in a taxi before, an Uber or anywhere, any taxi, and you're going from point A to point B, there is no other question but to get to the destination. And until you get to the destination, there's thoughts of your work or there's other entertaining thoughts, but there is never a thought of anything wrong happening to you via the taxi driver. That's because you have blind faith in his skills to take you from point A to point B. Example number two, a doctor. <clears throat> Suppose you are sick and taking home remedies does not work. So you decide to book an appointment for the doctors. When you go to the doctors, you first sit and he asks you, what's wrong? You say, my head hurts very much. It seems like I have a migraine. Now, the doctor, before prescribing an MRI, he prescribes some medicine, which is not OTC. So you have to go to a pharmacist to get. Now, you can barely read the medicine. Uh, it's very scribbly. Yet, the pharmacist can read it. So you give, the doctor says, take it twice, uh, twice a day once in the morning, once at night, you take the prescription to the pharmacist. The pharmacist gives you the medicine and you start the dosage. You don't know what the medicine does. You don't know what effects going to have. You didn't even get a chance to ask or even think about that. If I take this medicine with this food, will it have an odd reaction? There is no question with the doctor. May this doctor be a new doctor for you, or may this doctor be a 15 to 20 year old doctor for you. It doesn't matter. From day one till right now, you have never questioned your doctor. And you know that by going to him, he is going to fix your problem. That's blind faith. That prescription, doctors don't do this, I'm saying, but it's just an example. That prescription, we don't know exactly what it does to our body, what it functions, but you have faith in the doctor that that doctor will make you better within a couple of days to a week. No doubt. That's blind faith. And finally, the most prime example that will fit into your perspective is of an airplane pilot. <clears throat> an airplane pilot flies us at approximately 40,000 feet in the air. But when you enter his plane, going to your seat, looking at the TVs and entertainment going on, thinking about what meal they will give you, you sit down and after a short while, they tell you to buckle up and then the flight steward starts to give you directions about exiting the plane and oxygen masks and so on and so forth. Yet at that time, and we're not listening, we're usually texting on our phone or talking with our neighbor. And then after that, the, the, uh, the pilot says, we're ready for takeoff. 
our destination is for example the united kingdom london it will take approximately eight hours have a good flight that's it and we're off the runway and then the plane takes off and the pilot reaches at an altitude of 40,000 feet without any single doubt you don't know the pilot's name you don't know how old he is you don't know his marital status you don't know his mental stability you don't know what he does outside of his occupation besides flying a plane you don't know how many relationships he's been through you don't know what his background is you don't know if he has any other background that's not that he's not supposed to have you don't even know what his favorite food is not that that's relevant or anything but what i'm trying to get at is we don't know anything about him we haven't even seen his face we don't even know how he looks yet we put our life on the line at approximately 40,000 feet in the air that this pilot will take us from point A to point B from Newark to London Heathrow without any kind of trouble, without any kind of problems. And we will never see his face ever again. That's blind faith. From this question, I hope, or from this answer, I hope it answers your question regarding how to develop blind faith. Just like how we have blind faith in the taxi driver, our, our family doctor, and our plane pilot personnel, in the same way, we have the capability and ability of 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 developing blind faith in Bhagwan in his ekantik satpurush there is without a doubt you don't have to think in the same way over here you don't have to think you just have to grab on and accept that's how you develop blind faith moving on to the second question how can one remove and overcome their inner enemies such as ego, anger, greed, lust, jealousy, envy, etc., so on and so forth. A very, very good question because the whole world is being, you can say, completely shredded by these inner enemies. And as for you, a mumukshu of Bhagwan Swaminath, and you're asking how can one remove and overcome these inner enemies? It's a very, very good question. Again, according to Bhagwan Swaminarayan's Vachnamrut Kadada, 1st chapter 58, I'm going to read this paragraph context and let's see what Bhagwan Swaminarayan's perspective is. Thereafter, Manubhavanan Swami asked, Maharaj, while staying in the Satsang Fellowship, how can one eradicate all of one's faults? Also, how can one's bhakti towards God continue to flourish day by day? This is a dual question. But the first question, um, the first question that Swami asks, is the one that we want to focus on: is while staying in the Satsang Fellowship, how can one eradicate all of one's faults? Faults meaning these inner enemies. It's the same thing. Sri Jamaraj replied: The more one continues to imbibe the virtues of the Satpurush, the more one's bhakti begins to flourish. In fact, if one realizes the truly great Purush, to be absolutely lust-free, then even if he is as lustful as a dog, one will also become lust-free. If one perceives the fault of lust in the great Purush, then no matter how lust-free one may be, one becomes full of lust. In the same manner, if one views the great Purush to be full of anger, then one becomes full of anger. Therefore, if one understands the great Purush to be absolutely free of lust, anger, taste, egotism, attachment, all of those vices, 
then one also becomes free of all these evil natures and becomes a devotee of Bhagwan Swaminarayan. This is an open secret that is, you can say, the most vital element in satsang, and that's the Ekantik Satpurush. The Ekantik Satpurush, or one spiritual master who is enlightened, who has a constant connection with God, who has the 30 virtues of a sadhu, such kind of an Ekantik Satpurush, by understanding him to be free of all vices, one can also become free of all vices. There's two options. One is, for example, if you want to go to London again, and you're located in New York, you want to go via ship. Now, the Atlantic Ocean is in the middle. Now, there's one option of taking a ship and going from New York to the port in, located in London. And there's another option that you think you can do is swim. Now, trying to defeat one's inner enemies is kind of like swimming trying to do so much devotion, trying to do whatever one thinks in one's mind, in one's perspective, that's kind of like swimming across the ocean. How much can you swim until you tire out and drown? And the other hand, sitting in a ship and going from point A to point B is kind of, or is, in a similar fashion to taking the refuge of an Ekantik Sadpurush and understanding him to be free of all blemishes. That's a very, very easy, and especially if it's a cruise ship, you can enjoy the pool, you can do many, many activities and still get to your destination with little ease while sleeping. That's how easy it is. But the true Satpurush, the Ekantik Satpurush, he is looking for spiritual aspirants. But our goal is to attach to him. Our goal is to understand him because Bhagwan himself resides in the Ekantik Satpurush according to Gadada, first chapter 68, Bhagwan Swaminarayan's words. Bhagwan Swaminarayan has also said, Santahune Huntevari Santare. I am inside that sant, and the something is inside of me. We have this oneness. That's why that Satpurush is free of blemishes, because he is enlightened. Because if Bhagwan is inside of him, then what does Bhagwan have? Nothing. How can Bhagwan have any faults? In the same way, the Satpurush also does not have any faults. And by believing him to be free of blemishes, free of faults, one also becomes free of all blemishes. That's the easiest way that one can cross the ocean of inner enemies. I hope that answers your question. A second Vachnamrut that shows another solution as well that I wanted to also bring upon you is this one more is on a kind of exercising on your own basis on your in your inside of your mind that Bhagwan Swaminarayan also gives because every spiritual aspirant needs different solutions. So Bhagwan Swaminarayan has taken many many angles so that it can suit everyone. Bhagwan Swaminarayan is such a doctor that he is his his medicine list is so big that it's not comprehensible in, in the human mind. That's why there's a solution for everything in the Vachnamrut. And in this Vachnamrut Gadada middle chapter 15th, Bhagwan Swaminarayan gives us another way that one can eliminate these inner enemies or swabhaus as we call. 
Thereupon, Sriji Maharaj asked all the Paramansas a question. There is a single thought which is applied. If applied, can destroy any swabhav. Swabhav meaning one's bhav or one's nature. Nature in the form of faults may it be all these anger, grust, anger, lust, ego, greed, so on and so forth, or any other, you can say, faults that we are as well that we have in our day to day life that someone does not like. It, can, it This is in context with everything, regardless of how tough they may be. Without that, without the thought, without. Without that thought, the sabal cannot be eradicated even if one were to apply a thousand other thoughts. What is that thought? What is that single thought? By applying it, one's sabals can be eradicated. That's the question. No one could answer, so Mara then said, Here, I'll explain. If one has an enemy, and if that enemy were to ruin whatever work one is doing, or if he were to swear at one's mother or sister, then one would bear an intense aversion for him and would employ any means whatsoever to harm him. If not that, one would at least be extremely happy if someone else were to harm him. In the very same way, if the inner enemies of lust, anger, hinder a person while he is striving to attain liberation, he would harbor the same sort of enmity towards like a grudge towards them as well moreover that grudge would never dim diminish whoever applies such a thought can eradicate all sabals with that thought alone holding a grudge that this sabal has 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 damaged me in many ways has damaged many many relationships you know due to my sabal anger i've gotten angry at many innocent people and due to that they have become far from me so that anger holding a grudge against it when it comes up holding a grudge against one's ego because it has made one look very very bad in society all these kinds of different scenarios that one has experienced, one is experiencing, one will experience. If one wants to destroy that, those sabaos, then one must hold a grudge towards one sabaos, and that's the only way. So this way is one, and another way is to is to understand the Ekantik Satpurush to be free of all blemishes, according to the Vachnamrut. Very nice question. Moving on to the next, what's now, uh, next question. How can one stop worrying about people's negative opinions and actions? And how can one stop overthinking every situation? This is a very common, common, common uh, question. There's two parts to it. And the first part is how can one stop worrying about people's negative opinions and actions? Now, According to the Vachnamrut Gadada, first chapter 20th, Bhagwan Swami Narayan is very, very practical and he's also very blunt and straight to the point. So, this Vachnamrut that I pulled out, it's very, very blunt and to the point, but it will give you your solution. Sriji Maharaj then began The Jeev, which resides within the body, observes both the attractive and the unattractive. It witnesses childhood, youth, and old age, as well as a countless number of other things. However, the observer fails to observe itself, its own self. The Jew looks at objects externally, but it does not look at its own self. Therefore, it is the most ignorant of the ignorant. Furthermore, just as the Jew indulges in a countless variety of sights with the eyes, it similarly indulges in and knows the pleasures of the other vishes with the ears, skin, tongue, and nose, but it does not indulge in the bliss of its own self, nor does it know its own nature. For this reason, it is the most ignorant of the ignorant, the most sense senseless 
of the senseless, the most foolish of the fools, and the and the most vilest of the vile. Bhagwan Swaminarayan's method is to how the observer fails to observe his own self. The answer to this question, the question is how can one stop worrying about people's negative opinions and actions, is by simply, simply performing antar drashti or looking at one's own self. If you look at your own self, how many, how much negativity we have inside of ourself, how much we need to work on in order to become ekantik. There's so much that we have to do inside that one cannot find time to view outside. But that's only if one develops that kind of a, a, a thinking. There's so much tweaks we have to remove. There's so much bolts that are loose that we have to tighten that there is no other way we have or there is no other way we have to see or we have time to see other cars or uh, other people in general so antar drashti or looking at one's own self is the answer to your question the second half of this question is and how can one stop overthinking every situation now, one can stop overthinking every situation by performing bhakti or devotion of God and understanding God to be the all-doer. Overthinking every situation, meaning if I do this, will this happen? If I take this decision, will this happen? If I say this to this person, what will he think? What will that person think? All these different thoughts that are occurring in our mind is due to, again, the lack of antar drashti or looking at one's own self. But more so, to stop all these thoughts, these flow of thoughts, one needs to perform the devotion of God, chant His name, sing the kirtans of God, listen to His katha. These solutions, and understand Him to be the all-doer, these solutions will definitely completely calm your mind down because the brain is said to be like a monkey there is no way or the mind i can say there is no way that a monkey can sit in one single area for even five seconds that's how you can say unstable a monkey is in the vachnamrut and in the scriptures the mind's example is of a monkey It'll think about eating, and then in two seconds, it'll think about sleeping. And after that, it'll think about going out with friends. You don't know which thought to do. That's how the mind is. It's so unstable. But by focusing the mind's energy on the devotion of God, by performing bhakti of God, by understanding Bhagwan Swami Narayan to be the all-doer of every situation, he is doing everything. Whatever he's doing, he's doing for my benefit. There is nothing that he's done that has damaged me in any way. May I know it? May I not know it? May I see it? May I not see it? But understanding Bhagwan to be the all-doer will remove 99% of your problems along with that bhakti. And finally, I hope that, I hope that answers your question. And finally, the fourth question is how can one remove attachment to this body both mentally and physically a very very advanced and very very good question and for that there is two vachnamrut i want to take first gadada middle chapter 44th vachnamrut or bhagwan swaminarayan um vachnamrut in that there is a devotee by the name of valodru a brahman from the village of vaso who asked a question he says maharaj how can the feelings of inus and minus towards one's body and its rel and its relations be eradicated? So the question is, how can the feelings of inus, I, meaning I am this body, and my, meaning this is my car, this is my home, this is my mother, this is my father, how can that all be removed or er eradicated? Sri replied. The jiva has a misconception in that 
it does not believe itself to be the jivatma or the atma or oneself to be the soul in short distinct from the body instead it believes itself to be the body this is a very very great mis misconception to illustrate how the body clings to the jivatma consider a person who wears a dugli a dugli meaning a vest after having it sewn by a tailor that person then begins to believe that the tailor is my father and the tailor's wife is my mother such a person would be considered a fool in the same manner the jivatma or the atma or the soul is given a dugli or a vest in the form of this body which is born sometimes to a brahman couple sometimes to a low caste couple or in any of the 8.4 million life forms therefore a person who believes the body to be his true self and believes the parents of the of the body to be his own parents is called a fool and should be considered to be like an animal therefore as long as a person believes the body to be his true self his entire understanding is totally useless and as long as he continues to harbor vanity of his caste or his ashram he will never imbibe the vir virtues of a sadhu Bhagwan Swaminarayan is very very straightforward because he knows that this this soul this jeev has been traveling through innumerable bodies and still has not reached his akshardham Bhagwan's akshardham that's why Bhagwan has to give very very straightforward answers so that the Jew understands that hey you are like this not like this so just start believing and understanding and move forward Bhagwan Swaminarayan's compassion may his words be straightforward or even blunt is beyond comprehension because no other avatar in the past or incarnation or deity or anyone has came in the past has come down to earth and given such kind of knowledge Bhagwan Swaminarayan when he descended from his Akshardham 238 years ago and only lived a mere 49 years the works that he has performed and the scriptures that he has given and the talks that he has done in his Vachnamrut and the and the statements and verses that he has written in the Shiksha Patri are cannot be compared to anyone that's how great of a gift he has given us now our task is to absorb imbibe and apply his words and principles in our life so Bhagwan Swaminarayan states that and gives an example of a tailor and if you wear uh, if a tailor sews a, a vest for you and then he says here wear it would you believe that tailor to be your father and and the wife of the tailor to be your mother no in the same way this is kind of like a jacket this body is a jacket for the soul maybe in the next life one will get a jacket in the form of a cow maybe in the life after that in the form of a microorganism whatever one's karma one has done Bhagwan gives that person that kind of a body but not going off of off the topic to remove attachments to the body one has to believe oneself to be the Atma and how can that be done to compare when you compare something great to something that is low or something which you see more in than you don't in the other automatically your vision automatically your perspective towards that thing becomes great but if there is not two things to compare and if there's only one thing then you cannot develop any glory greatness or any perspective for that particular thing saying that when one understands how this body is its characteristics its features and compares it to the characteristics and features of the atma or the soul automatically one will shed one's affection for this body and develop affections for one's own 
true self, which is the Atma or the soul. How so? Let's compare. The body, it can be destroyed. The Atma, it has been through innumerable lives, yet as it's still the same, it cannot be destroyed. This body is false because it'll vanish. The Atma is true. It's Satya. It will not vanish. This body has taken a birth. The Atma does not have a does not have a birth or a death. This body does not know anything. It's Jad. It's completely useless. The Atma is full of Gnan or knowledge, pure divine knowledge. This body can be pierced, can be lit on fire. The Atma cannot be pierced or lit on fire. Automatically, from these from these kinds of comparison you'll think that I'm like this I cannot be destroyed and then automatically you'll think I am like this I cannot be destroyed I have no birth I have no death I am beyond this body this body is nothing compared to me the Atma when you think in this manner automatically all these attachments to the body will be removed in no time. This is the very solution which Bhagwan Swaminarayan shows in Sarangpur first chapter, Vajnamrut. And nonetheless, how can one behave as the Atma? That's kind of something I wanted to add because by believing is one thing and how can one behave? Bhagwan Swaminarayan in his Vajnamrut Gadada middle chapter 51 shows that only one who follows the commands of the Satpurush can be said to be under the influence of favorable circumstances. To deviate from those commands is the very definition of adverse circumstances. Therefore, only one who follows the commands of the Satpurush is behaving as the Atma. By following the commands of the Satpurush, by exactly doing what he says, one is behaving as the Atma according to Bhagavan Swami Narayan's perspective, vision, and principles. So these are the four questions that this devotee, spiritual aspirant had. If any of you have any questions, you're more than, uh, free, or more than free to email at loyadamnj at the rate gmail.com. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. Um, all of the answers are based off of Bhagavan Swami Narayan's Vajnamrut and the, the holy scriptures and that is the best way because one can get one's authentic answer from Bhagwan's own words there is no other better answer than Bhagwan's answer so i hope that the, uh, all these all your questions are answered and if anyone has any further questions one will be able one can email at loedamnj at the rate gmail.com saying this my humble 